Dear audience, welcome to the show Power Chat. In today's episode, we are discussing about the non-violent uh, approaches to human rights, non-violent activities taking at the global and national level. Joining me today is Ms. Catherine Hughes Fetak, Associate Director of Global Field Initiatives at International Center on Non-Violent Conflict, ICNC. Please allow me to welcome her. Welcome to the show, uh, Miss Catherine. Thank you so much. I'm how, really excited to be here. How have you been? Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, I've been very busy the last several months and uh, the last two weeks in Nepal. So th th this is your first time here in Nepal? It actually is. Um, I've worked on Nepal issues since 2007, um, but it's the first time I've actually got to visit. And what is your impression over Nepal, uh, this country's diversity? Yeah, so I, I actually, um, because in the U.S. where I am, um, we have many Nepali communities, so I've learned about Nepali holidays and dancing and kind of the community aspects. So when I got here, I felt very much at home. Um, it was a beautiful country. I've seen many of the hill country. Um, I really love the people. I love momos. Those are my favorite food here. And, um, and I've just found people very aware, very welcoming. Um, and as you said, the diversity is really great. Okay. Mm. Tell us about uh, uh, the work of your organization. Um, in short, it is known as ICNC, International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Mm -hmm. What does it do? Mm -hmm. How do you work with the organizations and people mm -hmm. across the world? Okay. So basically, ICNC, International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, many people, first of all, get um, a little confused with our name because they think, how could there be nonviolent and conflict together? So what we look at is we're probably the most um, prestigious, maybe, and most um, foremost organization in the world that studies specifically strategic nonviolent action and strategic nonviolent resistance. Uh, you can think about Martin Luther King, Gandhi, um, Nelson Mandela, when they had the anti-apartheid struggle, parts of that were nonviolent movements. And so basically we look at research, evidence, um, we have a lot of writing and scholars that we support around the world, uh, and that's in our academic side. Then we also work with online classrooms. We have um, a big Fletcher Summer Institute, ICNC Institute, uh, that's gone on for many years, since 2007, every year, um, which is advanced study in international um, nonviolent conflict. Uh, we also then have the f field program, which is what I'm over. And basically, in the field program, we look at practitioners and activists that are fighting uh, in the grassroots level for their rights, for justice, for equality, and wanting to use nonviolent struggle to do that. Um, it may be climate change, it may be women's rights issues. We have a lot of people fighting anti corruption with nonviolent movements, uh, disability rights here in Nepal, I've been working with. Um, how to force people to get to a peace process. How once you're in a peace process, how you actually force the powers to implement the peace process. Um, we also work with people that are, are struggling against unjust governments, uh, self-determination struggles. So it's really the gamut around the world and different issues that we're working with, both local, national, and actually international as well. So uh, ICNC basically works with both the individuals and organizations. Mm. Uh, so how do you partner with the organizations working in the areas of human rights or the mm -hmm. non-violent activities, mm -hmm. non-violent ways of claiming their own rights? Mm -hmm. What is the working modalities with the organizations? Mm -hmm. So basically we're always locally driven. We don't get funds from the U.S. government. Uh, we're a family educational foundation. And so we, we don't have any agendas that we're pushing, except to teach people the research, the evidence, and how you wage nonviolent struggle or civil resistance. Uh, we work with local groups, grassroots organizations around the world who ask us for training, for information, for translations into their own languages, who we give fellowships. We started just now a small grant program so people can transfer the information, train people locally, who are working in these movements for equality and justice. Uh, and then we partner with groups around the world. So we have partnerships with the U.S. Institute for Peace. Uh, we have partnerships with many institutes around the world, university groups. Um, we've been at Civicus many times and partnered with groups there. And we especially partner with, again, grassroots organizations that don't even have to be registered because we find with human rights 
many of those um, can't register if they're really doing good human rights works because of repressive governments that are not letting them register anymore. We see the space closing for civil society and especially for grassroots activists. Um, a lot of governments are shutting down a freedom of speech, freedom of expression, um, and a lot of activism work. And so we also work with people that aren't registered and are really struggling at the grassroots level uh, for those issues. Well, Miss Catherine, I will come back to you on the impact of your programs globally okay. and yes. also in Nepal. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you on uh, the your areas of works uh, in the areas of the PISH. You also sub mm -hmm. to uh, some of the institutions on mm -hmm. PISH, mm -hmm. including that of PBI, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yes. So uh, how do you analyze the peace process of Nepal? You are here for some programs, some workshops, and you have met with some of the ex-combatants. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is your analysis? What is uh, your perception about them? Yes. So, um, and what I say to everyone, everywhere I travel is, ICNC believes that local people have the most wisdom, um, knowledge, um, ability to analyze their own situations. And what we try to look at is allowing them to have tools, information, um, evidence, case studies from different places in the world so that they can choose what they want to use, what will work best in their own movements because not everything works the same every different place. There's a lot of different local contexts. Uh, in Nepal, what I see that's similar to Colombia, uh, Liberia, uh, Palestine, a number of different places that have had peace processes over the years, um, Sri Lanka and others, is that basically there is a situation where people struggle, whether it's non-violently or even with violent guerrilla struggle for rights and justice and equality, and they at times get to a peace process, they negotiate. Um, if that peace process isn't negotiated in a fairly equal power, power balance situation, many times that's the worst thing that could happen. In fact, the status quo is put in place, the powers, the elites are in power, and then the people get more and more frustrated if it's not implemented. What I see in Nepal is an amazing struggle. Um, you have the nonviolent 19-day people's movement, 2006-7, uh, and um, you actually were able to meet your goals, which was to change the monarch into a democracy. What's happened that I see and that I hear from other people here um, is that that peace process has gotten stalled. There are a number of power groups, power holders that are having a hard time kind of letting go of that power and actually implementing the agreement. Um, as we know, it took a long time to get the Constitution, and now people aren't all happy with that. Um, and so I think that you know, part of what we would teach people is how to struggle nonviolently, how to pressure through protests or hunger strikes or economic boycotts, which are some tactics, um, to actually push that peace process forward so that it's implemented. And so people don't get frustrated and head back to arms which is maybe what they know. The ex-combatants that we worked with were telling us that they were tired of violence, that they had seen a lot of destruction uh, for themselves and for others, for the Do, do you victims. see any uh, changes uh, on their perception? You know, it's already a decade that uh, they mm. become ex-combatants. Yes. You know? yes. And uh, what are their perceptions? Have they changed their perceptions? Uh, the way they followed in the past that of the violent activities? Mm. So what I heard from them um, at this workshops that we were doing, once we were able to show them the evidence, uh, the fact that nonviolent movements in the world over 100 years and 323 major movements that we studied, basically 53% of the time nonviolent movements succeeded in their goals and only 26% or half of that did armed struggle succeed. So then we were able to show them why that is, um, why you gain credibility, why you gain a lot of people, which are key to winning your struggle um, with nonviolent movements, um, what happens with the destructive side, the fact that nonviolent movements are usually faster and less costly for lives than violent struggles. Once we were able to talk about that and discuss that with them, they actually um, were really excited about the idea of using nonviolent struggle to get to their rights and equality and opportunity. Um, they haven't been treated well. Uh, they haven't really, it hasn't followed through on agreements for them. And um, the fact that they could reach that justice, reach those um, rights and living in dignity without having to become violent again, they actually were very excited about and very supportive. And in fact, they've been trying to use nonviolent struggle 
um, with their um, recent um, protests where they've chained themselves to the buildings and the walls and they've actually kind of occupied some of their Maoist buildings and the leadership to say, look, you're not listening to us, you're not following through on your agreements with us, you're not honoring what we did um, in our roles for the country, which is what we understood, and that many of them were child soldiers and didn't really have a lot of understanding at the time what, what was going on. And so in that way, they've been raising awareness. Uh, they've been getting a lot smarter with their struggle. And I felt that um, they had a very good chance at success using nonviolent action and methods. Well, uh, Ms. Catherine, uh, you shared your experience uh, based on your meetings with the ex-combatants mm -hmm. here in Nepal. Uh, you work with different uh, groups. Mm -hmm. uh, participating in the violent activities in the past mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or uh, claiming their rights, mm -hmm. protecting their rights by means of non-violent mm -hmm. approaches. Mm -hmm. How difficult or how easy it is to convince uh, the people mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. follow the paths of non-violent conflict mm -hmm. or no non-violent activities. Mm -hmm. So actually it's a lot easier than I expected. Um, I have been to places like Uganda where they've been going off to Al-Shabaab in Kenya, the same thing. Uh, Nigeria with Boko Haram, other groups that are looking at ISIS or other struggles. And what I've found has really been um, eye-opening. People, even the youth who are very rowdy and excited and want something to change and happen, um, when they hear about the nonviolent method, and again they hear the evidence and the fact that again, of those nonviolent movements that win, those 53%, 60% lead to open societies and democracy. Only 6% of those of the armed struggles that won. So when they look at that information and they talk about why that is the case, and they start really understanding that, they say, we don't want to have war. We don't want to have more violence. We've had civil wars. We've had our family members hurt and killed. We've had our villages burned down. We've had many things that we haven't gone to school or we have had our, our communities destroyed. And if we can find a way that will actually produce um, outcomes, that we can actually gain our demands without turning to violence, we are so excited to hear that. People don't teach us that a lot. We only hear about armed struggle or doing nothing. And once we know there's this middle way that actually works more effectively and leads to more democratic societies, they actually are very excited and open and they want more and more and more information and knowledge about that. And I've been really surprised how easy that is. I tell them, it's your life, it's your community. I'm not pushing the fact you should do this. I'm not judging choices you're making now or in the past. I'm just giving you the knowledge and the information so you're aware of that and you can make different choices if you choose for your situation. And having said that, by the end of almost every seminar, every meeting that we've had, people are saying, we don't want to do violence, we want to try the nonviolent way. And we're excited we've learned how to do it well and strategically, not just marches, not just protests, not just bandas, which is all we knew before, but really looking at the 200 tactics, the 200 methods that Gene Sharp showed, which is a, a big researcher, there are so many ways to be able to do this, economic boycotts political boycotts, um, blockading roads, sit-ins, hunger strikes, which you've had in your own country lately. So there are a lot of methods that if you do them smartly, if you spread out high risk and low risk, if you use different groups of people and audiences to reach, they can really be effective. Well, uh, you were trying to uh, elaborate uh, the name of your organization, yes. ICNC. Yes. What do you think that um, uh, the conflict should continue with, be it violent <laughs> or non-violent? <laughs> uh -huh. Would you uh, elaborate on that? Yes. Yeah, so again, the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, people say, how can you have nonviolent conflict? It should be conflict resolution. It should be um, violent conflict or something. And I had an argument um, in India recently, a couple of weeks ago, with a Gandhi guru who said they can't be together, those two words. And I said, actually, Gandhi was the one that said we need to wage conflict, that if there's injustice, we need to fight that. We don't just sit back and do nothing. We don't just think about it. We act. And so, but we hopefully act nonviolently because that has a better chance at succeeding in our goals and again at transforming society versus just switching 
dictators or politicians that are in power. And so, you know, I see that there are times to wage conflict. There are times in families and communities where there are unequal power structures. Uh, there's, again, inequality, lack of opportunity. There are serious grievances that people have. And just talking about it or just trying to negotiate it, if you don't have power equally, won't work. And so in that time, you need to have some conflict. You need change. You need to move the power around. Um, and you need to have power for the people that didn't have it before, more equal power. So having conflict is a way to do that. At that point, you can go to negotiations. You can do conflict resolution. You can come up with peace processes. But they're much more likely to be implemented. They're much more likely to succeed. If you have waged conflict initially and dealt with some of the grievances and um, made the power balances closer so that people can negotiate from a fair perspective. If you don't do that, if you have a peace process where it's been pushed and forced on some group, right, and they have not gotten what they really need to live a decent life with dignity, then you'll probably go back to armed struggle. There'll probably be a violence in the future. Violent activities or violent conflict is visible, you know. Mm. It may mm -hmm. be in the form of attacks. Yes. Or, or some other visible things. But uh, what are non-violent activities? Yes. Yeah. How could you differentiate violent and non-violent activities? Mm -hmm. So what we say, there are a number of different kind of gray areas and definitions. One I like is not intentionally causing harm to any other person or your opponent. So things like protests. Uh, marches, sit-ins, um, economic boycotts, so when you have an opponent who is doing business with your money and you refuse to buy things from them anymore. Um, when you have someone that is asking for your vote, but when you vote for them, they're not following through on their promises, so you boycott that vote. Most of the tactics that we talk about have to have a lot of people um, to be using them, to be organized, to have a really strong impact. Um, again, in Nepal right now, um, with Govinda KC, um, basically he is on a hunger strike. He has very just um, grievances he's talking about, changes and demands he wants. But by himself, he probably wasn't going to get very far. But people have now started joining him. They've seen the justness of his cause. Um, he's been a very good organizer. Um, he's gotten people to understand what he's about. And so due to that, he has changed the power balance. He has gotten some of his demands, and he is moving forward at creating change. So that would be an example. In South Africa, when the whites were having an apartheid regime with all of the black people, they used to go to their townships, and they would have marches and protests. The soldiers, the military, would just rush in. They would kill them. They would arrest them. They would torture them. But nothing changed. At one point, they thought, why don't we, we have to impact those people that are in power. So why don't we stop buying goods from the white uh, businesses where we get all of our clothes and our laundry and our cars and our goods? Why don't we just stop and we take them, buy them from our own groups? And so they organized. They had 98% people that were supporting the boycott. And within a very few months, the white owners, the business owners, were suffering so much from um, not having money for their goods, for their services, they went to their own government, the apartheid government, and said, you have got to listen to these people's demands because we are going to go under, we're going to go bankrupt. And so because of that, the, the black movement, the ANC, got a lot of their demands. And the United Democratic Front, which was the group that was much more diverse, a lot of white people and black people together, that was struggling nonviolently. And so they got a lot of their demands by um, hurting the the economic interests of this other group, um, which was the white businesses. Well, Ms. Catherine, these examples may be motivational for uh, those following the path of non-violent activities. Mm -hmm. But how do you uh, justify, in case the lives of uh, the people or protesters mm -hmm. um, yes. engaging in you know a long-term yes. hunger strike, mm -hmm. uh, come to the problems? Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, the non-violent activity means of uh, conflict mm -hmm. should not give, uh, I mean, should put lives of the people in danger mm -hmm. so in case of the Go Dr. Govinda Casey here yes, in Nepal? Yes, yes. So basically I would say, and I tell people, 
You have to decide how serious your issues are and your grievances. You have to decide how much cost you're willing to take, how much sacrifice you're willing to make. And in any serious struggle, the government or your opponent, businesses, governments, even um, non-state actors like drug groups or others, they will try to repress you. They will probably at some point use violence to suppress you. But if you end up turning to violent struggle to either protect yourself or to fight back, you have the 6% chance at ever getting a democratic society, and you have a 26% chance of actually getting to your goals. You have a 53% chance if you can stay nonviolent and stay disciplined, no matter what they do, and you have a 60 to 70% chance of getting a free and open and democratic society at the end of your movement. So which would you rather risk, right? And our studies show the cost is much higher for those that turn to violent struggle. There are massacres, genocides, and a lot of civil wars that start occurring is that process. Also, it's actually faster, according to our information, to get your goals and demands met with nonviolent struggle rather than armed struggle. And I see that again and again when I look around the world and people have been struggling 20, 30, 40 years with armed conflict, they still haven't reached their goals. They've destroyed their country, they've destroyed their lives, they've themselves been attacked and their families have been attacked, and yet they still haven't gotten their goal. So that's what I tell people, it's your choice, you've got to figure it out, but what we're seeing is you have a much better chance and much less cost if you stay nonviolent, but that doesn't mean you won't have any cost. And it doesn't mean it's still not dangerous, and it doesn't mean it's still not something you have to think through carefully before starting. There are a lot of other ways to lessen the repression, and one of them is not using public um, at-risk, high-risk methods or tactics. So if you have a regime that's shooting people or killing people or torturing people for the change, and people keep going to the streets, over time, you're going to lose a lot of people. People will be afraid. They won't want to risk, right? And so they may, they may go away from your movement. And the key to winning your movement is having lots and lots of people, right? Women, men, rural, urban, children, uh, differently abled people as part of that. So if you see that people are afraid, if you see there's too much cost, you go to what we call more dispersed, more low-risk uh, methods. That can be ringtones on phones across the country. It can be wearing certain kinds of clothing. It can be things like in Turkey where they had an electric campaign because of the corruption and they turned on and off their lights for one or two minutes every evening. But the government, the politicians saw lots and lots of people turning off their lights at the same time all over the country and they thought, oh my goodness, this is a huge movement. There are a lot of people involved, so we better listen to well, them. Well, Ms. Catherine, yeah. there are very interesting <laughs> things coming out from you, yes. but we are coming to the end of this. Okay. So, <laughs> finally, would you highlight on how nonviolent means of conflict or nonviolent conflict processes, activities, mm -hmm. facilitate mm -hmm. uh, development, mm -hmm. ensures participation of the different marginalized groups? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you highlight on that yeah. very quickly? Yeah. So I would just say that, again, there's something about the process, this idea of the 68% of nonviolent movements that lead to open, more democratic societies, that having a horizontal leadership, having the leadership much closer to the people, um, having the people build their capacity with skills, um, with planning, with strategy, having the people empowered through acting, through actually doing the nonviolent movement, not a few soldiers, guerrillas in the jungle. Something about that leads to a better outcome, to a more democratic society, and to more development that goes on in the country as well, because part of the process is involving a lot of people, is the idea of unity, which is one of our main indicators for success, for the movement is having unity. So if they have to, for a year or two, develop unity and a unified vision for the future and sell it to a diverse group to have a lot of people involved, that then is much more likely to lead to development and to capacity building and to a peaceful society. Well, Ms. Catherine, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure talking uh, to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Dear audience, time now to wrap up the show. Keep watching us. See you next week. Namaste.